On today's episode, we'll be traveling across the pond to talk about Dennis Nilsson, who killed at least 12 men, posed with the bodies, bathed the bodies, masturbated with the bodies, dismembered the bodies, stored the bodies beneath his floorboards, removed them to pose and masturbate with them again, burned the bodies, and then flushed them down his toilet. It's another doozy of a story today on Two Murder Morons. This podcast includes adult language and graphic depictions of murders and murder scenes. This is a comedy-style true crime podcast. We do our best not to make fun of victims or victims' families. However, we do introduce comedy while telling graphic stories. If the mix of comedy and true crime is not your thing, this may not be the right podcast for you. Audience discretion is advised. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the show. My name is Andy, and sitting across from me, as always, always. is my good buddy, Mike. Hey, happy Easter. Happy Easter. Yeah, Easter. Well, wow. it's not Easter for them. It's Easter right now. Well, it is. But it's like April but I'm just 11th. Saying. Well, I know, but I'm just saying. Belated. Yeah, belated. Well, you know, I'm trying to get in the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Can't you tell? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Oh, here we go. Oh my god. And and as usual we lose track of time and where we're at. Yeah, well, it only took us ten minutes to do the intro. Oh, I know. We I, I I'll try I'll try and make a blooper reel or something Ooh. out of it because good lord, if if you want to talk about having a catastrophe trying to start an episode. We had it. God. Mm. Well, first I messed up the intro thirty seven times, had to start over. Then I realized it wasn't even recording to no, begin with, no. so I guess I can't make bloopers out of that. Mm-mm. Uh, then the intro wouldn't play. It's yes, weird day. It's it's been a weird. Well, it's Easter. Yeah, it's Easter. It's yeah, something. Yep. It's because we tell these six stories. The Easter Probably. bunnies. Well, Easter bunny. Yeah, he nibbled on your cord instead of leaving us some jelly beans. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Apparently, technology is not my strong suit. <sighs> wow. I'm, it is in some ways. But it is. When something goes wrong, I'm like, I yeah, well, it happens. What, yeah. Oh, you're, oh. You're, you're supposed to drive the ship. <laughs> You're like, I'm just sitting here. I don't when you passenger, come on, man, let's go. When you f it up, it's yeah. it's all on you, dude. It's on you. Yeah. <laughs> let's just look at the difference of what's in front of me and what's in front of me. <laughs> my vape. <laughs> you're vaping your phone yeah. and your sunglasses. And my sunglasses for some reason. Well, it was sunny oh, when I came in. Good. Yeah, true. Yeah. What do you think? Should we dive right in? We got a wild one. Let's get her done, dude. We got a wild one. Yeah, let's do it. Look at this guy. You know who this oh my guy God, is? Dude. He looks like you know, he looks like Stephen King in a way. You know what? He he does kind of look like Stephen King, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Oh, man. Well, that's a good time to point out, too, for those of you that are listening. There's also a video version of this podcast. So uh, tune into either YouTube or Spotify if you want to see the pictures we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I just thought I'd throw that out there since, again, we're talking about pictures on correct, the show. Correct. But this is Dennis Nilsson. Hi, Dennis. He's uh, yeah. What's up? What's hey, up, Denny? What up, Denny? Yeah, he is definitely kooky looking. Yeah, he's, a, he, um, he's one of those. And, and he has... This is one of my favorite true crime stories. He's one of my, this sounds sick to say, favorite serial killers. It really is. But it's it's such an interesting story. Like, the stuff he does is out there. Because, you know, you kind of sound like, you know, I'd be like, man, he's like, that's my favorite baseball player is what you're kind of making. It. I know. Well, I don't, that's the thing. I don't want to make him, you know, it's not a fan. I'm not a fan of him. You don't like write to him or anything, do you? <laughs> No, there are no uh, there are no letters being delivered okay. to him in just prison it. for me. Just, just check it. I just meant like this story is so far out in left field. It's very fascinating. It's a fascinating story that really it pulls you. That's the that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for putting that's, it that way. Yeah, for. it's a very fast. Not only the crimes that he commits are fascinating and unique, mm -hmm. but the way he gets caught is unique. The way he acts post arrest is you. You know everything yeah. about this dude is yeah unique. Different. It's different. Yeah. Because it's across the pond. It's across the pond. It's across the pond. It's across the pond. <laughs> I ain't doing that. <laughs> Let's no, not do let's it. Stay we, that. We've learned our yeah, lesson, yeah, I think. Get away from that I'm surprised we haven't gotten any comments about my stupid Australian accent on the oh, Catherine Knight episode. Oh, man. Well, let's jump into Denny's childhood, shall let's we? Let's do it. Let's do it. 
Let's hear about his childhood. So this here is Dennis Andrew Nelson. Okay. He's born November 23rd, 1945. Okay. Right after World War II. In Fraserburg, Aberdeenshire. Okay. Which is somewhere over there. If you're from the UK, comment. That's close to what? I, I don't know. Oh, I should have looked at... See, I'm messing up our first sentence. I didn't research where that is. That's all right. It happens. It's somewhere in the United Kingdom, Mike. Okay. Um, he's the second of three children, born to Elizabeth Duffy White and Olav Magnus Mokshim. Wow. I know. Those are That's some names. That's a mouthful. Yeah. Um, Mokshim was a Norwegian soldier mm, okay. who had traveled to Scotland in 1940 as part of the Free Norwegian Forces. Okay. Following the German occupation of Norway. Yeah. All right. After a brief courtship, he married Elizabeth White in 1942. And the newlyweds moved into her parents' house. Hmm. The marriage. I'm sorry. No, i have gone. I was going to say the marriage between Nilsson's parents was difficult. His father did not view married life with any seriousness. Okay. We know some people like that. Yeah, I know some people like that. Uh, he was preoccupied with his duties with the free Norwegian uh, forces. Well, he had a cause. Yeah, he had a he was dedicated yeah, to that. To that. Um and he made little to no attempt to spend much time for his family. Okay. Basically. Um after the birth of their third child, Nelson's mother concluded that she had rushed into marriage without thinking. Hmm. It took her three kids to figure that out. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. The couple divorced in nineteen forty eight. Wow. So our little guy is four. And they get divorced. Okay. So we got a neglectful father. I, it's the pattern, man. Yeah, well, we're starting out with yep, yeah. yeah. So we got neglect. There's start. There's one. Yeah. Um, all three of the couple's children. So Olaf Jr., Dennis, and oh, Sylvia. There's an Olaf Jr. Olaf, oh. and we're not talking. We're not talking frozen here. Jesus, this isn't Olaf. It's Olav. O l a v. Oh, okay. Like lavatory. Olav. Yeah, that's weird. Um, but all three of them had been conceived on their father's brief visit to their mother's household. So <laughs> what this sounds like is it's like, <laughs> you're listening. God it. damn, I'm starting to snort. <laughs> Jesus. So they get married. And basically, he's in the armed forces yeah. the whole time. And he just stops by for the weekend, knocks up the wife, and yeah. they have three kids. Yeah. And then bang her and go. It takes it takes three to for her to realize, well, this isn't, yeah, this isn't a good work. thing. Yeah, I'm basically a... I'm, a, I'm like a brothel stop. Kind of, yeah. I yeah. can see why she would feel that way. Yeah. Uh, so her parents, they never approved of their daughter's choice of husband. Hmm. So her parents knew that this wasn't going to work. I wonder why. Um, and they were supportive of, of Dennis's mom after their divorce. Okay. Well, they have to. Yeah. They probably didn't have a job. Right. They're supporting her, I think. Yeah. Would yeah. be my guess. Yeah, probably. Um, but they, you know, you know, the typical, like, we told you so. <laughs> like, we didn't like this guy. He's a jerk. Yeah. Told you. Yeah. Told you. You know, move the kids and, you know, come up yeah, here. Come on we'll, back home. We'll take care we'll of take you. Take care of it. So, Dennis here uh, was reportedly a quiet yet adventurous child. Okay. Okay. His earliest memories were of family picnics in the Scottish countryside with his mother and siblings. Um, he remembered uh, spending time with his grandparents. And remembered being taken on long countryside walks carried on the shoulders of his maternal grandfather. Okay. So he has good memories of... That's a pretty good little childhood there. Grandparents, yeah. Minus, um, the, minus the father. Yeah, minus dad being... Yeah, in the picture. Absentee and, yeah. you know. So it said he was particularly close to his grandfather. Yeah. Uh, his brother and sister, though, um, occasionally accompanied Dennis and his grandfather on these walks. So you got all three grandkids and, and yeah. granddad. That's yeah. cool. That's good. Uh, despite only being five years old, Dennis vividly recalled these walks as being, quote, very long along the harbor across the wide stretch of beach up to the sand dunes, which rise 30 feet beyond the beach and on uh, and on and on. He later described this stage of his childhood as one of contentment. Okay. Sounds that way. Like, yeah. I'm sure gra maybe grandpa filled him in with a lot of stories. and Oh, yeah. Probably, probably, probably a good time. He also called his grandfather, quote, um, a great hero and protector. Okay. So grandfather, I think, is kind of more of a father more dad. figure. He's more than, dad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, he added that whenever his grandfather, who was a fisherman, was at sea, uh, quote, life would be empty for me until he returned. Okay. So I think... So grandpa's dad. Very much the so. Role. Yeah, very okay. much so. Which is good. Yeah. 
1951, however, Grandpa's health isn't doing so good. Okay. Um, but he continued to work on the fishing ships. On Halloween 1951, while fishing in the North Sea, he died of a heart attack at the age of 62. Yeah, I mean, it's a good life for that. I mean, that's a good, that's a good age for back then. True, but the pattern we always talk yeah, about. I know. Yeah. The absentee father who's mm-hmm. kind of a jerk. Now you've got who he considers dad mm-hmm. gone. is gone. While well, he's still young. Right, and this is his hero, remember? Yeah. Right. So his body was brought ashore and returned to the White family home prior to burial. In what Nilsson later described as his most vivid childhood recollection, his mother, weeping, asked him whether he wanted to see his grandfather. Which makes sense. Yeah, makes I would sense. do that, too. Do you want to see yeah. Grandpa? You know, some, For some, it's uncomfortable. When Dennis replied to her that he did want to see him, he was taken to the room where his grandfather lay in an open coffin. As Nilsson gazed upon the body, his mother told him his grandfather was sleeping. Okay. Adding that he had gone to a better place. So we got this kind of weird here. You've got your kid looking at grandpa's body and it's kind of like he's sleeping. Okay. Like just not. Could we wake him up? Right. That's what I mean. Like not connecting with reality here. Yeah. Like he's, he's gone, but mom's doing the. Oh yeah. He's just asleep right now, but he's not going to wake up. Yeah. Because he's somewhere better. In the years following the death of his grandfather, Nelson became more quiet and withdrawn, mm-hmm. uh, often standing alone at the harbor watching the boats come in and out. Missing his walk. Yep. At home, he seldom participated in family activities and retreated from any attempts by adult family members to demonstrate any affection towards him. Okay. So, Grandpa's gone, and he's not going to let anybody else no, replace that. He's, he's basically put up a wall. Right. Nilsson grew to resent what he saw as the unfair amount of attention his mother, grandmother, and later stepfather displayed towards his older brother and younger sister. Which is kind of like he's rejecting everybody else's. It's his fault, though. I mean, he's he's put this wall up and is not going to let anybody in. Right. Right. So he kind of did it to himself. Nilsson grew to envy Olav Jr.'s popularity. Apparently, Olav was a Yeah, Olav must have been the shit. Must have been the business shit. Yeah. Yeah. You have to beep that out. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I know. It's you can say whatever f- you want. I know. It's best with you. <laughs> he often talked or played games with his younger son, his younger sister, Sylvia. Okay. To whom he was closer with than any other family member following his grandfather's okay. death. Okay. Well, at least he has some good connection with his sister. Yeah. On one of his solo excursions to the beach in either 1945 or 55, Dennis here became submerged beneath the water and was almost dragged out to sea. So he had a trouble fighting that current come back in. Yeah, yeah I get it. Yeah. It's kind of a near death experience here. Mm-hmm. He initially panicked, flailing his arms and shouting um, as he gasped for air. Mm-hmm. He recalled believing that his grandfather was about to arrive and pull him out. Okay. Uh, before experiencing a sense of tranquility. So I feel like he might have been close, really oh, close it sounds to like death. It, yeah. Uh, his life was saved by another youth who had dragged him ashore. Okay. Shortly after the incident, Nelson's mother moved out of his grandparents' home into a flat with her three children. So now he's pulled out of grandpa's yeah. home, too. Now he's been pulled out of where you're secure and right. feel the most comfortable. Right. She later married again. She married a so builder. his husband number three? Yes. Okay. Right? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, she married a builder named Andrew Scott. That's that Andrew's name. There we go. Hey. There we yeah. Go. yeah. Okay. Um, with whom she had four more children. Holy shit. <laughs> Jesus. Four more? More kids. Yeah, she had to be what? Mm, she probably had her. Well, I guess she probably. I don't know. Well, she's got seven at this point. I wonder if this is another situation where he only visits on the weekends. I don't know. It sounds like he uh, actually visited a little bit more often. So, And she had these four children in four years. So she basically yeah, put them out one yeah, after another after for another. four years. So, yeah, he's. Oof. That's a busy life at that house. Right. <laughs> Although Dennis initially resented his stepfather, the new one. Probably. Um, get it. Whom he, v- he he viewed him as an unfair disciplinarian. Okay. So apparently the new stepdad's the disciplinarian. Yeah. Which is, you know, not always good. No, it's not, gonna... but I mean, but yeah, it's the role you play, I guess. Yeah. Um, it says here he did gradually come to uh, grudgingly respect him. Okay. So he wasn't a complete, 
you know, it's not like Dennis here just was like, fuck you, you're not my dad. Yeah. For, you know, he he came to a point where he's like, all right, well, I got to. Yeah, know, I got to abide by this. You yeah. got to do what he says. Do what he kind says. Of I'm out. I'm out. 16. At the onset of puberty, Dennis discovered he was gay. Oh, okay. Which initially confused him and led to him having some shame about that. Well, because back then, and you know, that's uh, that wasn't it, as acceptable as it is now. Right. So. He kept his sexuality hidden mm -hmm. from his family and his few friends that he had. Because many of the boys to whom he was attracted had facial features similar to those of his younger sister, Sylvia. On one occasion, he sexually fondled his own sister. Okay. That's so this is such a weird connect. Like, I'm gay and I'm into boys, but some of the boys I like kind of look like my sister. So I'm going to fondle my sister because she kind of looks like the boys. Yeah, I'm really kind of lost on that one. Yeah, that's kind of an that's odd way. Uh, yeah, it, I, I mean, I just like I would like to see a picture of his sister. See what she. Yeah, I couldn't like. find a family. If, if she's comparing. He's compared to his friends. I don't know. I kind of wonder what she looked like. Kind of wonder. Yeah. yeah. Well, this, so this is interesting. He did this. Here's maybe a little. It doesn't make it any clearer, but it, you know, maybe it clears up a little bit. He believed that his attraction towards boys might be a manifestation of the care that he felt for her. Okay. So he's confused. Yeah, he's thinking he's very confused. Maybe I'm not really gay. Maybe it's because I really care about my sister and these boys look like her that I'm attracted to them in this way. Yeah. Okay. He's he's trying to figure it out. Trying to figure out what, I, what he is. I get yeah, it. Yeah, I get it. Dennis made no efforts to seek sexual contact with any of these peers to whom he was sexually attracted, although he later said he had been fondled by an older youth and did not find the experience unpleasant. Okay. So basically, he had a boy fondle him, and yeah. he was like, but, but kind of liked it. I liked it. You know? Yeah. Um, on one occasion, Dennis also caressed and fondled the body of his older brother as he slept. Olaf? Yes. Oh, I'm surprised Olaf didn't beat his butt for that. Well, he's sleeping. He's in there being a creeper on Olaf. Olaf's sleeping. Olaf, Olaf must have been a really heavy sleeper. Well, it doesn't describe. It just says fondled. Okay. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, well, I mean, I, 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 I don't think, know how much happened, but maybe Olaf was drunk. I don't know because you think uh, you might wake up somewhere down there. Yeah. Just oh, saying. As a result of this. Olaf Jr. began to suspect his brother was gay. Oh. So I guess Olaf knew something, something was had up. happened. Something was up. And his brother, Olaf, here regularly belittled him in public. Okay. Referring to Dennis as a hen, which oh. in Scottish, they're all, this family's all Scottish. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I mentioned that yet. Yeah. In Scottish dialect, that means girl. Okay. Like, you know, we would say, I don't even know what we would say. I, I guess know. some people would say, like, you're being a puss or yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. They say, well, hen, you're being a yeah, hen. Yeah. I mean, you're being a girl, basically. Yeah, yeah. Dennis initially believed that his fondling of his sister may have been evidence that he was bisexual. Okay. So he's still very confused. But he's still very confused. Things. Yeah. He didn't read the one. As Dennis progressed into adolescence, he found life in the town they were in increasingly stifling with limited entertainment amenities. Or career opportunities. Yeah, sure. Because I think they're in this kind of smaller town. Yeah. Um, he respected his parents' efforts to provide and care for their children, but okay. began to resent the fact that his family was poorer than most of his peers. So he's the poor kid in the group. Yeah, sounds like it. Uh, with his mother and stepfather making no effort to better their lifestyles. Okay. Um, well, I mean, you, know, you get to a point, you only do so much. True. Especially if you live in a small little area where there's only so much you can do. Right. That's true. But I think as him being an adolescent, he's viewing this as yeah we're we're pretty bad off, and they don't seem to they're not like trying to find better job. You know, they're just yeah. content with this life, and he's not very content. Yeah. Uh, Dennis seldom invited his friends to the family home. I guess he's embarrassed. Yeah, know, embarrassed by, by their home, you, whatever. And at the age of fourteen, he jo joined the Army Cadet Force. Okay, good step. Good step. Um, he viewed the British Army as a potential avenue for escaping his rural origins. Okay. So well, he's trying to get out of the country. Typical. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So let's get into his army service here. At least he went in the army. Yeah. So, you know, so, so far, really, the only bad, bad parts of this kid is experience so far in his life. His father basically neglected him. Didn't want anything to do with him. Right. Had a good life with grandpa. Grandpa passes away. So, yeah, you lose grandpa. 
So really, so far, he hasn't hit the, the – none of the real prime factors have really hit him yet. Right. Does that make sense, I guess? I mean, he's confused about what he is sexuality-wise. Right. But, I mean, his dad wasn't an alcoholic. They didn't beat him. Yeah, you know, the usual stuff. Right. So, yeah, it's kind of makes me wonder. Yeah, where this all eventually where, comes from. Yeah, where from. all this come from. Right. Yeah, we'll get there, I'm sure. Well, yeah, we'll get there. Okay. Uh, Dennis's scholastic record was above average. So he's okay. a smart kid. Smart kid. He displayed a flair for history and art. Yeah. But shunned sports. Hated sports. Well, I mean, okay. Yeah. He's a hen. He's a hen. I don't he finished his schooling in 1961 and briefly worked in a canning factory. Okay, yeah. Well, there's some. Well, obviously there was something to do there. Yeah, we got a canning factory. Well, it probably must be close to the water. Pro- well, I think kind of, so. Probably well, is it a fish factory or something? Well, that, I don't know. I'm I don't just know. Assuming. Yeah. Well, if Grandpa was a fisherman. That yeah. Had been so close yeah, to it had to yeah. be you know, a big fishing thing. Yeah. Um, after three weeks at the factory. <laughs> Dennis informed his mother that he intended to join the army and receive training as a chef oh, for the army. There you go. Dennis passed the entrance examinations and received official notification that he was to enlist for nine years of service. Nine years? In 1961. Wow. Man. Nine years. Jesus. <laughs> wow. But if you're like, he's looking for a career. I understand. So that, that to right? him, nine might seem short. Like, I want, I'm going to want to do this for a lifetime. Yeah, you're right. I guess. Man. Mm-hmm. I'm glad we do four here. Ooh. So uh, Dennis began to excel in his army duties. Okay, good. And he later described his three years of training at Aldershot as, quote, the happiest time of my life. Okay. He relished the travel opportunities afforded to him in his training. Okay, that's good. And recalled as a highlight his um, regiment taking part in a ceremonial parade attended by both the Queen and Field Marshal, Lord Montgomery of Alamine. Okay, yeah. So that's a highlight. That's a highlight. You're, you're going to yeah. do a parade for the Queen. Yeah. You know, you get to, you yeah, know, she's right stuff. there. Yeah. Makes sense. While stationed at Aldershot, Dennis's latent feelings began to stir. Okay. But he kept his sexual orientation well hidden from his colleagues, probably because it's probably because there's a reason for that. I mean, he's, yeah, yeah. Um, he never um, showered in the company of his fellow soldiers for fear of developing an erection in their presence. Probably a good thing there, I guess. Probably, yeah, That's, yeah. Back then, yeah, yeah, especially in the military, like he's probably gonna get his ass beat. If oh yeah, happens. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, instead, he opted to bathe alone in the bathroom, which also afforded him the privacy to masturbate without discovery. Because he's thinking about all those guys, probably, I guess. Right. Yeah. In mid-1964, Dennis passed his initial catering exam. No, oh, cool. And was officially assigned to the 1st Battalion of the Royal Fusiliers in a town in West Germany. Oh. Where he served as a private. In this deployment, Nilsson began to increase his intake of alcohol. Uh, well, it's a military thing. I mean, this is in Germany. Yeah. But what does alcohol do, Mike? Yeah, it makes you horny. Makes you it lowers well, inhibitions. Yeah, lowers, yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, <laughs> um, want to go into town and have some fun. Right, right. He described himself and his colleagues as quote hardworking, a hardworking boozy lot. Well, so I get that. I, mean, I was in the military. I mean, we we partied and, and worked still hard. functioned. Right. Yeah. His colleagues recalled he often drank to excess in order to ease his shyness. So they just thought he was shy. But so he's, if he drank a lot, he must have been more, I must have brought him out of his shell. He's the life of the party. He's yeah. got alcohol yeah. flowing through him. On one occasion, Dennis and a German youth drank themselves into a stupor. And when Dennis awoke, he found himself on the floor of the German youth's flat. Okay. No sexual activity had occurred, but this incident fueled Nilsson's sexual fantasies, which initially involved his sexual partner, um, invariably a young, slender male, that's his type, Okay, being completely passive. These fantasies gradually evolved into his partner being unconscious or dead. So he, he kind of... He, Jesus Christ. He first develops... I mean, he went all... Dude, he, he just went... He goes from zero to six. Yeah, exactly. Jesus. Wow. That's fast. Yeah. Well, and it could just be the way this is written. But he... he you know, he's learning, okay, I had this experience where I woke up, you know, and we're passed out on this guy's floor, and he's thinking, oh, I kind of like how this guy is passive. Yeah. He, he likes to be the dominant. Yeah. But, but then, he hasn't done anything yet. 
No, he hasn't done anything. But he's already here. I mean, he's already thinking this now. Right, right, right. And it quickly turns into like, oh, what if they were unconscious? And then that quickly turns into, oh, what if they were dead? Maybe they were dead. Maybe that'd be hot. Uh, I don't know. I don't know about hot, but Mm. On several occasions, Dennis also made tentative efforts to have his own prone body sexually interfered with by one of his colleagues. Okay. In these instances, whenever he and his colleagues drank to excess, Dennis would pretend he, he would pretend he was inebriated. Okay. In the hope one of his colleagues would make sexual use of his supposedly unconscious body. Okay. So he's doing this thing. He's partying with a bunch of guys. He's not really that drunk, but he acts really drunk. And then, oh, I'm going to, I'm passed out. Uh oh. Uh oh. And he's like hoping someone's going to. Yeah, come over and fondle him. Come over, give him a little yeah. tickle. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, whatever. Mm. So following two years of service there, uh, Dennis returned to Aldershot, where he passed his official catering exam before being deployed to serve as a cook for the British Army in Norway. Okay. Okay. Yep. In 1967, he was deployed to the state of Aden, formerly Aden Colony. Uh, it's now part of Yemen, if anybody knows this area. Okay, yeah. Um, where he again served as a cook at the AI Mansura prison. Okay. Well, all right. Yeah. Um, this posting was more dangerous than his previous posting in West Germany or Norway. Mm-hmm. And Dennis later recalled his um, regimen losing several men, often in ambushes and route to the army barracks. So he's seeing a little bit of well, action here. Yeah, I get it. And he's seeing some, yeah, some of his buddies get killed too. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dennis was kidnapped by an Arab taxi driver oh, who beat him unconscious and placed him in the boot of his car. But I think trunk. Trunk. That's the... Yeah. Yeah. That's the boot. Upon being dragged out of the trunk, Dennis grabbed a jack handle and knocked the taxi driver to the ground before beating him unconscious. Oh, okay. He then locked the man in the trunk of the taxi. <laughs> put him in the boot. So, yeah. yeah. So, put him in the boot, mate. Put him in the boot. Oh, God, I think I went Australian again. Yeah, you did. Ugh. A little bit. So, he's, he's at the point now, like, he's seeing some shit. Yeah. Like, he's, he's, he's got buddies dying from ambushes. Here, he's just almost yeah, kidnapped. Almost kidnapped and killed, probably. And probably killed, but luckily he, well, well, I shouldn't say luckily because maybe if this guy would have killed him, obviously what comes next would've, wouldn't would've, have happened. Yeah, but it would have saved a lot of people's lives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so unlike all of his previous posts, Dennis had his own room while he's stationed here in Aden. Okay. Okay. This afforded him a privacy to masturbate without discovery. Yeah. You sit there and want, yeah, it's whatever. So he's doing it probably more and more now. Yeah. Yeah. You just do it all day long. He develops fantasies of sex with an unrestrained or deceased partner. That is just sick. Um, and with those fantasies being unfulfilled. Dennis compensated by imagining sexual encounters with an unconscious body as he masturbated while looking at his own prone nude body in the mirror, (laughs) which I'm trying to discuss. Like, is it, (laughs) how do you do it? Like, I don't know. Looking at yourself in the mirror, naked prone. Yeah. And you're pretending that you are the, are you like one eye? Like, yeah. How are you doing this? I don't know how you masturbate about to yourself. I, I guess don't look at your own face. I don't know. I mean, shit, who knows? I don't mm-hmm. know. I guess he's thinking about all his buddies. Probably. Yeah, all Probably. his military buddies. On one occasion, uh, Dennis discovered that by using a freestanding mirror, he could create an effect where if uh, positioning the mirror so his head was out of view, mm-hmm. he could visualize himself engaged in a sexual act with another man. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. That cleared up a little bit. Yep. To Dennis, this ruse created the ideal circumstance in which he could visually split his personality. So now we're... Now we got split of personalities. Like consciously (laughs) splitting his own personality uh, during these masturbatory fantasies. Yes. Dennis alternately envisioned himself as being both the domineering and the passive partner. So he's now seeing himself as both sides. Yeah, either way. Yeah, either way. Yeah. Mm. Kooky. Check out this painting here. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, it's a it's a interesting painting. Yeah, we're gonna talk talk about that here in just a second. Okay. So Dennis's fantasies gradually evolved to incorporate his own near death experience with the taxi driver. Okay. The dead bodies he had seen in Aden, mm-hmm. 
and imagery with a 19th century oil painting entitled The Raft, the Raft of the Medusa, which is this, this painting here. painting right here. And he gets, he gets off to this. Yes. And for those of you listening, this painting depicts an old man holding the limp nude body of a dead youth as he sits aside the dismembered body of another young male. Yes. I mean, there's a lot more going on in this picture. Yeah, that's got, that's got the got a penis there, I think. But he, yeah, I don't know, can't tell. There is a lot of death in that fo- in that I said photograph in the painting. Painting, right? Oil painting. Um, but are they triumphant? Because some of those guys are holding tails up like they're like they're winning. Maybe I don't yeah, know. I don't really know the full story with this painting or, or what this is about, but it's definitely graphic. Yeah, it is. Hmm. Hmm. In Dennis's most vividly recalled fantasy. A slender, attractive, young, blonde soldier who had been recently killed and battled. So a, a dead guy. Dead guy. Is dominated by a faceless, dirty, gray-haired old man who washed the body before engaging in intercourse with it. Okay. This is his new fantasy now. All right. It's very specific. Very specific. When Dennis completed his deployment in Aden, he returned to the UK and was assigned to serve with the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders at Seton Barracks in Plymouth, Devon. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. We know where none of these yeah, places yeah. are, but yeah, I don't either. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did they wear Argyle socks or something? Uh, maybe that's where Argyle socks come Could from. Could be. Yeah. Or the sweater. Throughout his service with this regiment, he was required to cook for 30 soldiers and two officers on a daily basis. Okay. So he's working. Yeah. Uh, Dennis served at these barracks for one year before being transferred with the Argyle and Southern Highlanders to Cyprus in 1969. Ooh, Cyprus. That'd be nice. That'd be a good duty station. Oh, tell me. I know nothing about Cyprus. Tell us about well, Cyprus. I don't either. I've never been there, but I bet it'd be a good station. Where is it? Huh? Isn't that over uh, to Greece and all that? Is it? This is another one where they're going to be like, you guys are morons. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know where it is. Get on the... <laughs> You don't have to hide the phone. Hide it, hide it from me. Find where like I'm an idiot. If it is from Greece, is it, if it is near Greece, that does seem like a good. Uh, yeah. Sorry. But anyway, while you're looking that up, so he's transferred there in 1969. Months later, the regiment was transferred to West Berlin. So we go from Cyprus <laughs> to West Berlin. That sucks. Where the same year Dennis had his first sexual experience with a female. Yeah, it's an it's a it's an island country in the eastern Mediterranean Sea, north of. The Sinai Peninsula, uh, south of. Uh, let's let's get into the whole thing here. Let's go Wikipedia. Yeah, um, Wikipedia it up, Mike. Yeah, uh, the Sinai Peninsula, south of Anatolian Peninsula, and west of Levant. Uh, yeah, it is geographically a part of West Asia, but its culture ties and geogra- geopolitics are overwhelmingly Southeast European. Cyprus is the third largest and third most populous island in the Mediterranean. It is east of Greece. So, yeah, it's near Greece. That's what I thought. So, suffice to say, it's a nice, nice place. Yeah, probably got some nice-looking women, but he's into guys. Yeah. So, but I bet they got some Greek statues. Yeah. He could masturbate, too. Well, when he goes from there to West Berlin, he has his first sex with a female. Oh. Which is interesting well, that he does this. That's female, huh? She's a prostitute Oh. Okay. Um, like who's explain. who he solicited. Okay. Okay. He bragged of his sexual encounter to his colleagues. Okay. Which I understand. Yeah, they're probably giving him shit. They're probably giving him shit. So I he's he was like, oh, crap. Hey, this girl. see you with a chick, dude. What's up with that? Right. So it probably forced, almost yeah. felt forced to do it. Um, He later stated that he found the intercourse with the female both overrated and depressing. <laughs> really? Well, he's gay, Mike. So, I know, of course. But still, I mean, that's it, like you. If you ended up having sex with a dude oh. to appease your buddies, you would say it was. <laughs> Well, I don't know about overrated. I don't but know overrated. You would probably say it was depressing, though. Uh, and yeah, and sore. <laughs> oh God, let's not. <laughs> yes. Well, my God. Fucking, Fuck. I, I, don't, I couldn't even picture that. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I can't. I mean, no even. offense, but I just it's not it's not my tea. Right. No, I get it. Yeah. That's but that's why it's disgusting for him. Yeah, I get it. Because it's the same thing as me saying, you know. You're a straight guy. Well, go have sex with a guy. Yeah. You would be disgusted by it. Correct. Just like he's disgusted by having sex with a, with a female. Yeah. But he found with his sister, though. But because she looked like oh, yeah, his, right. buddies, then, his buddies. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. Okay. Well, um, this prostitute didn't look too good. I don't know. I mean, it is Europe. Everyone's beautiful over yeah, there. Yeah, they are. But after a while, it depends. True. 
Following a brief period with the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders in Iverness, um, Dennis here was selected to cook for the Queen's Royal Guard. Ooh, he must have been a good cook, or he must have really been a good soldier. Yeah. Um, in January 1971, before being reassigned to serve as a cook for a different regiment in the Shetland Islands. Okay. Where he ended his 11-year military career at the rank of corporal in October of 1972. So he did 11 years in the military. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool, though. He got to cook for the Queen's Royal Guard. Like, that's that's cool. Yeah. Between October and December of 1972, Dennis lived with his family as he considered his next career move. On more than one occasion, and so yeah, sorry, you got no, back, you're, back. You're fine. You know, I got to do this. Yeah, every now and then, I think. back it up because it's something history. So he had to do a nine-year service, but he actually did eleven. So he really, he must have kind of re-enlisted or something there for a minute. Yeah, he must have. Hmm. He was probably loving it. If he kind of sounds like it. If he likes to cook, and yeah, if you got to go cook, cook for the Royal Guard. Yeah. Okay. Um, on more than one occasion in the three months that. Uh, Nelson lived in Stricken. His mother voiced her opinion as to her being more concerned with his lack of female companionship than his career path and of her desire to see him marry and start a family. So he's he's starting to get pressure from mom. When are you going to get married? When am mm-hmm. I going to get grandkids? Get grandkids. You know. Your brother's married. Right. <laughs> yeah, probably. You got six grandkids with him. God. How are you going to do something? I need more grandbabies. Yeah. Come on. Get with it. On one occasion, Dennis joined his older brother, Olaf Jr., his sister-in-law, because Olaf Jr. is married. Olaf Jr. is married. um, And another couple to watch a documentary about gay men. Interesting choice for a family get-together. Yeah. Hmm. Everyone present viewed the topic as, you know, they, they weren't happy watching this film, right? Except Dennis who adamantly spoke in defense of gay rights. So they're watching this documentary. His whole family is like, oh, gay men. You know, they're they're shit-talking it. And he's standing there defending, oh, the gays need rights, and, you know, da, da, da. A fight ensued, after which Olaf Jr. informed his mother that Dennis was gay. Oh, so Olaf let mom know that he's gay. Oh, yeah. Dennis never spoke to his older brother again. After this, well, I'm sure he did. He was probably pretty embarrassed because, like I said, again, back even at this time frame, it's still right. And he didn't even get to come out. Yeah, his brother, you know, there's this big fight, and his brother's like, "Well, fuck it, I'm telling okay, mom. Yeah, mom, he's gay, he's gay, mom." You know, yeah, that's got to suck mm. for Dennis. Yeah. Um. So he never spoke to his older brother again, and he maintained only a sporadic written contact with his mother. Mm. So he never sees mom again either. He just randomly writes her. What if mom didn't take it too well? Probably not. Um, also, um, sporadic writing only contact with his stepfather and younger siblings. Yeah. So he basically bounced out of that family. Yeah. After this, they must have been a must have been pretty uncomfortable after he com- after his coming out. Right. So they may not have taken it too well. So then, what do a lot of guys do when they leave the military? What career path do they go into? Law enforcement. Exactly. Yeah. So he decided to join the Metropolitan Police and moved to London in December. It's a good job. Yeah. Good career choice. Yep. Gets to be around a lot of men again. True. So and we're up to April 1973 now. Okay. Okay. All right. Dennis completed his police training and was posted to Willisden Green area. Okay. Yep. No right where that is. Do you? No. (laughs) Not at all. Not, not not even close. Here, I thought you were going to enlighten us. Like, oh, yeah, I've been there on vacation. <laughs> no, 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 no clue. <laughs> no picture. I have no idea. <laughs> so he's he's still a cadet and a junior constable at this point. Okay. Um, he performed several arrests, but never had to physically subdue a member of the public. So he's made some arrests. He's done some reports, but he hasn't gotten any action okay. yet as a cop. Dennis enjoyed the work, but missed the com- the comrade. Uh, why can't I say that word? Comrade. Comradeship. Is that a word? I don't know. Um, Basically, he misses the Army. Yeah. Like, all right, this cop job's cool, but I miss being in the Army. You know, I get that because when I got out of the service, you know, I mean, after a while you do. I I miss it still. I miss the the camaraderie. Yeah. 
you know, having I'm, all the buddies, all the guy time, and and I'm sure after he's on the department for a while, I mean, he's going to get that same kind of camaraderie. Yeah, I would think. No, yeah. kind of apparently, together. Apparently, he wasn't. That's weird. And because of this, he begins to drink alone in the evenings. Ooh. During the summer and autumn of 1973. Dennis began frequenting gay pubs and engaged in several casual liaisons with men. Okay. Okay. So right. he's finally... He's finally found a place to fun. go. Yeah. He viewed these encounters as, quote, soul-destroying. So he's still conflicted inside yeah, is. about this homosexual thing. Yes, he is. Um, well, probably because it's looked upon as a bad thing, so... He's thinking it's up. gotta be bad. He yeah. grew up, you know, during a time when... You know, I mean, it just, it wasn't. Yeah, it, it was frowned upon a lot. Yeah, it wasn't the path you wanted to, yeah. Right. So he describes these as soul-destroying liaisons in which he would, quote, only lend his partner his body in a vain search for inner peace. I don't know. He's, How's that work? He's definitely conflicted. Yeah. Um. In August of that year, following a failed relationship, Dennis came to the conclusion that his personal lifestyle lifestyle was at odds with his job. So he's he's basically telling himself it's not good to be a gay man in police work. Well, because I'm sure. Well, they're probably all giving him shit. Giving him shit. Yep. His birth father died the same month. Yeah, but he had really no. Uh, right. Yeah, no connection. No with connection him with the man. But he did leave each of his three children a uh, thousand pounds, which oh, at the okay. which at the time is the like to now would be like being left ten thousand three hundred and sixty dollars. Yeah, that's good. I'd take it. In December, Dennis resigns from the police force. I'd buy a lot of gay porn. Probably. Yeah. Between December of nineteen seventy three and how, May, how many years was he on the department? Uh, he went on in seventy. So seventy three started in seventy three. Um. Oh, he wasn't there very long. Yeah, he started in April of seventy three, and by December he resigned of that year of that of, year of, of seventy three. Jesus, that's not even so. April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. So nine months. Wow. Yeah. Between December nineteen seventy three and May nineteen seventy four, Dennis worked as a security guard. Okay, so we'd be from being a, a Bobby Constable to being a security guard. <laughs> yeah, you know, security guard. Okay. Um, the work was intermittent, and he resolved to find more stable, secure employment. He found work as a civil servant in May 1974. I wonder why he didn't try to find like a cook's position, a chef or something. You would think, right? Like he did the 11 years yeah, in the I mean, army as a, a cook, sh- like work at a restaurant or something. Yeah. I don't know. Makes don't, no sense. I don't know. Hmm. Um, Dennis was initially posted to a job center in Denmark, uh, on Denmark Street, where his primary role was to find employment for unskilled laborers. So he's working at like a job finding place. Yeah, helping yeah, other yeah, people. yeah. Like Indeed on his place. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Or like a recruiter type position. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, at his workplace, Dennis was known to be quiet, uh, a quiet, conscientious employee who was active in the trade union movement. So he's active oh, okay, in the Okay, he's active. Okay. Yeah. His attendance record was mediocre. Although he frequently volunteered to work overtime, leading several colleagues to suspect he was something of a loner. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm sure they figure that out eventually. Right. In 1979, Dennis was appointed acting executive officer of the company he was working for. Okay, so he's moving up. He was officially promoted to the position of executive officer with additional supervisory responsibilities in June 1982. Oh, okay. So he's, he's been here... Eight years at this point. He's sticking in there. Um, And he transferred to another location, um, continuing in this job until his arrest. So this is what he's doing while he's committing his crimes. Oh, so we started the crimes now? Yes. Okay. I was going to say, because we went a long time there. Nothing going on. Yeah. Yeah. But now... Yeah. Now he's letting himself loose. Okay. And boy, does it get good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In November of 1975, Dennis encounters a 20-year-old man named David Galachin. Okay, so 1975. He was born in 1945. Mm-hmm. So he's 30. Yeah, he's th- yeah, 30. So it's not that big of an age gap, 20-year-old, 30-year-old. No, not really. Um, 
so basically he sees this guy being threatened outside a pub by two other men. Mm. Dennis intervened. Gay pub? Doesn't say. Doesn't just says a pub. Okay. Uh, Dennis intervenes in the altercation and took Galatch into his room at 80 Tigmouth Road in the Cricklewood district of North London. Okay. So he basically saved this kid from getting his ass hey, inside hey, the bar. Hey, Susan, I saved your life, man. I want you to go to the flat and we'll have a, have a, I have a cocktail. Right. Yeah. The two men spent the evening drinking and talking. Okay. Dennis learned that Galatchin had recently moved to London from Weston, Weston Supermare, Somerset. Yeah, I know that. He learned that this 20 year old was gay. Okay. Unemployed. Okay. And residing in a hostel. Hmm. You, know, do, you know, hostel is right. Oh, yeah. Okay. And who do we target, Mike, if we're a serial killer? Hmm. Yeah. Someone who doesn't have a job that will be looking for him. Mm hmm. Family. Um, no family close. Residing in a, yeah, no family yeah, around. We're in a hostel. They're not going to really look for him too much. Yeah. Other than they want their money. The following morning, both men agreed to live together. That was quick. Wow. We're moving quick. Jesus, man, that's a courtship there. <laughs> it's, um, it's a subject, though. So. Right. So Dennis uses some of the inheritance he, he had just gotten from his father. Okay. And uh, they go and find a larger property okay. to share. Yeah. Okay. Several days later, the pair viewed a vacant ground floor flat at 195 Melrose Avenue. Oh, Melrose Place. No, totally different Melrose Place. <laughs> <laughs> Other side of the damn earth. Well, okay. Well, you never know. Does figured... Melrose Place take place in California? Well, yeah, but I figured maybe if it was Melrose Place, maybe they're all the same. <laughs> this is the 195 Melrose Avenue oh, okay. in Cricklewood. Cricklewood. In London. London. Okay. Well, okay. it could okay. be a happening place. <laughs> they, decide, they decide to move into this property. Okay. Prior to moving into Melrose Avenue, Dennis negotiated a deal with the landlord whereby he and Galachin had exclusive use of the garden at the rear of the property. Oh, okay. So apparently this property is kind of split up. It's flat. It's been split up into apartments. Yeah, probably apartments. And there's a backyard. Yeah. So Dennis somehow is like... Well, he's probably maybe because he likes to cook. So he wants his own garden, grow his own stuff. Yeah, so, but that's kind of cool. You can, yeah. you know, you got this building with all these people, but you work out a deal where only we get to use. Yeah. The garden outside. Yeah. Hey, what a deal, yeah. More power to him. Maybe he gets the garage, too. The flat was supposed to be furnished, okay? But, oh. But upon moving in, the pair found it to be largely bare. Bare. So there's a couple things in there. Not like furnished to how they thought it should have been. They have to go to, they go to Walmart and get a table that you have to put together. <laughs> Is there a Walmart in Cricklewood back in 1970? Uh, I'm not sure. Somewhere. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so... The couple uh, redecorated, furnished the entire flat okay. over the next couple months. Uh, most of this work was performed by Galachin. Of course. Uh, with Dennis having discovered Galachin's lack of employment ambitions, he began to view himself as the breadwinner. Okay. And they're like, so they're, well, they're I mean, starting to get He's a chief the, executive officer. Right. Dennis later recollected that he was sexually attracted to Galachin, but the pair seldom had intercourse. I don't know. Maybe they were fighting over money. Well, yeah, or I don't know. I don't know. So initially, Dennis experiences domestic contentment with Galachin. Okay, so he's content with it, but yeah, yeah, it's yeah, is what it is. Something comfortable. But within a year of their moving in together on Melrose Avenue, the superficial relationship between the two men began to show signs of strain. Okay, they slept in separate beds. Both began to bring home casual sexual partners. Oh, okay. So now we're up to we're up to open relationships. Right. Right. Galachin later insisted that Dennis had never been physically violent towards him, but he did engage in verbal abuse, and the pair had begun arguing with increasing frequency by early nineteen seventy six. Okay. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Dennis later stated that following a heated argument in May nineteen seventy seven, he demanded Galachin leave the residence. And Galachin later informed investigators that he had chosen to end the relationship because of this. Yeah, makes sense. So Dennis formed brief relationships with several other young men over the following 18 months. Okay. None of these relationships lasted more than a few weeks, and none of the men expressed any intention of living with him on a permanent basis. It was yeah. all very casual. Well, yeah, they're, yeah, they're, yeah, yeah, they're, they're not looking for a, a tie down. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like Tinder. Yeah. You know, right. Kind of look for a date. Yeah. Yeah. 
by late 1978, uh, he was living a solitary existence. He had experienced at least three failed relationships in the previous 18 months, and he later confessed to having developed an increasing conviction that he was unfit to live with. So he's just starting to feel like I'm no good. Yeah, for I'm anybody. no good for anybody. Throughout 1978, he devoted an ever increasing amount of time and effort and, uh, to his work. So he just he's one of he buries yeah, himself in his job. Yeah. Yep. And most evenings he spent consuming spirits or beer as he listened to music. Okay. I can handle that. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, a, is that the flat? That's Melrose Place. That's a nice looking place. Dude. It looks pretty hip. Yeah. Pretty clean. So there, what I say, it's the a, ground it's a, it's floor? A, it's an Audi sit down front. Yeah. Melrose, well, Melrose Place. I think this is a more recent photo. Yeah, than, I, think, I think so, too. Yeah. Looking at the car. Yeah. But what did I say? They had the first floor flat. Yeah. First floor flat. So they probably have the whole floor, and there's someone, what, living above them? Yeah. 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 So let's get to where Dennis kills his first victim, shall we? Oh, okay. We're moving up. 14-year-old Stephen Holmes. Oh, f- kids no this happened december 30th 1978 mm. holmes encountered dennis in the cricklewood arms pub so you know london well, you yeah, got, yeah, you know, yeah you can generally get younger age and and there's a pub within walking distance of wherever you're living at basically True. yeah um so holmes had this 14 year old had gone in there and unsuccessfully had tried to buy alcohol yeah it you know, and they were like, felt, no, dude, you gotta be 16. Yeah, you look like you're 10. Yeah. Get, get Come back when you're 16. Exactly. Um, according to Dennis, he had been drinking heavily alone on the day that he met Holmes before deciding in the evening that he must at all costs leave his flat and seek company. So he's drunk and be horny. drunk at home. Yeah. Basically. Dennis invited Holmes to his house with the promise of the two drinking alcohol and listening to music. Okay. So he tells this kid, Hey, come on over. Yeah, you can drink at my place. Exactly. Of course, the kid doesn't realize that there's going to be a, uh, a tie to this. Right. The kid just wants to get drunk. Yeah, he just yeah. tried to buy alcohol, yeah. and here's the savior. Like, yeah. Hey, I got plenty of stuff. You want to come hang out? Yeah, come right. hang out. Dude. We listen to music, and you get drunk. I got a whole liquor cabinet, man. Yeah. Um, Dennis later said that he thought that this kid was approximately 17. So still not appropriate. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I love the excuse of like, yeah, you did this to a fourteen-year-old. I no, thought he was like seventeen. <laughs> yeah, he was at a pub, right? At Dennis's home, both he and Holmes drank heavily before they fell asleep. The following morning, Dennis awoke to find the sleeping Holmes beside him in his bed. Okay, okay. In his subsequent written confessions, Dennis stated he was quote afraid to wake him in case he left me. Ah, so he's like instantly possessive over this kid. They haven't even done. They got drunk and the kid fell asleep. But he's like, but that's that's his uh, that's his that's way he is. He did it with the last guy, right? Don't so he, leave me. You're don't mine. leave me. You're mine. Yeah. After caressing the sleeping youth, Dennis decided Holmes was to quote stay with me over the new year, whether he wanted to or not. He really didn't want this kid to <laughs> yeah, leave. Yeah, obviously. Reaching for a necktie, Nilsson straddled Holmes as he strangled him with the necktie into unconsciousness. Okay. Before drowning the teenager in a bucket filled with water. Oh, so we're doing the bucket. Yes. We're going to waterboard with a bucket. Yes. Wow. Dennis then washed the body in his bathtub, like oh. literally gave the dead body a bath. Of course. Well, that's what you do. Before placing Holmes on his bed mm-hmm. and caressing his body. Mm-hmm. He's dead at this point. Yeah. We want to give him a bath, though. Right. Want a clean body. <sighs> Dennis masturbates twice over the body. He then waited for the body to, you know, get rigor mortis. Yeah. It takes about, about four hours. Four, like, four to six four, hours. Four to six hours, yeah. Um, and the, he, he believed this would enable him to stow the corpse beneath the floorboard. So he's waiting for him to harden up. I was going to say for lack of better term, yeah. harden up so harden he up. can yeah, 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 stick yeah. him under yeah. the floor. Yeah. Holmes's bound corpse remained beneath the floorboards of Dennis's flat for almost eight months. Oh, God. Eight months. And they didn't have AC probably in that place either. Ugh. 
before Dennis built a bonfire in the garden behind his flat and burned the body on August 11th, 1970. Got the smell, man? Probably because it started smelling. Dude, they got, there's people who live above them. You would think they would. It's, the flies that that the flies that that attracts. I know. Oh, oh. yeah! I can't imagine. Mm. Can't imagine. So later, reflecting on his total killing spree, uh, Dennis stated about killing Holmes. "Quote," and, and this is where he's getting kooky. Yeah. "Quote: I caused dreams which caused death. This is my crime." Basically, he's living out his dream, his I, fantasies. I guess. Whatever, yeah. He added that he had, quote, started down the avenue of death and possession of a new kind of flatmate. Well, remember, he said he, he didn't want him to leave. Exactly. So if he was still alive, he would have left. Yeah. So I got to kill him to get him to stay. Yeah. On October 11th, 1979. Dennis attempted to murder a student from Hong Kong by the name of Andrew Ho, whom he had met at St. Martin's Lane Pub and lured him to his apartment okay. on the promise of sex. Oh, okay. So he found another gay man. So Andrew Ho was into it. Let's go back. Let's go hook up. Yeah. Dennis attempted to strangle Ho, mm. who managed to flee from the flat and reported the incident to police. Okay. Wow. Dennis was questioned in relation to the incident, but Ho decided not to press charges. Okay. Uh, okay. He should have. Two months after the attempted murder of Ho on December 3rd, 1979, Dennis encountered a 23-year-old Canadian student named Kenneth Ockenden, who uh, had been on tour on a tour of England visiting relatives. Okay. Oh, he's got family there. That's not a good one. That's not good. Right. Dennis encountered Okenden as they both drank in a West End pub. Upon learning the young man was a tourist, mm -hmm. Dennis offered to show him several London landmarks, uh, an offer in which Okenden accepted. So, hey, come on, man. I can take you around and show you some cool spots. Yeah, because obviously his family can't. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, Dennis then invited the student to his house on the promise of a meal and further drinks. Okay. So this is kind of the norm. Yeah. Hey, hey. Kind of befriend him. Yeah. Then, hey, why don't you come back? We'll make some burgers and I got yeah. some beer or whatever. Yeah, some beer. We'll hang out. All right. Cool. Play some Scrabble. Play some Scrabble. Exactly. The pair stopped at a liquor store on the way to, to Dennis's residence and purchased whiskey, rum, and beer. With Good combination right there. <laughs> That's a Ooh. terrible combination. Good combination. Right? Wow. That's cocktail there. What is it? Mm. Uh, liquor before beer, you're in the clear. Beer before liquor, never sicker. Mm -hmm. Just make sure, kids, make sure you drink them in the right order. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Ockenden insisted on sharing the bill. So they're splitting okay, the bill. Okay, so we're going to split the cool. bill. Okay, well, okay, we're just good. <laughs> Dennis was adamant he could not recall the precise moment he strangled Ockenden, but recalled that he strangled the young man with the cord of his headphones as Ockenden listened to music. So I feel like this is like he snuck up behind him. And kill, you know, he's got half and he just yeah. grabs him and strangles him. Wow. I took a while. He said he strangled the young man uh, with the headphones um, and that he recalled dragging Ockenden across the floor with the wire wrapped around his neck as he strangled. So he's dragging this dragging guy. By the yeah. Yeah. Cord. Yeah. He's, he's, he's dragging strangling. Yeah. Before. <laughs> He did this before pouring himself half a glass of rum and continuing to listen to music on the headphones with which he had just strangled Ockenden. So he strangles this kid, drags him across the floor by the headphones mm -hmm. over to the liquor cabinet. Yeah. Kid's now either unconscious or dead. Yeah. Puts those headphones, headphones on. on. Yeah. Yeah. Made me a... Yeah, shit. Man, let's just... Time to relax. That was, that was a lot of work. Let me give me a drink here. <laughs> right? Mm. Good Lord. Before I wait for rigor mortis to set in. The following day, Dennis purchased a Polaroid camera. Oh, dear God. And photographed Ockenden's body in various suggestive positions. He then laid Ockenden's Dude, corpse. Wait a minute. Yeah. Okay, so you know rigor mortis set in. Oh, it had. Yes, this Could is Could you imagine day. what he had to do to get him in various positions? I can only imagine the sounds. And yeah. Of everything breaking. Yeah. And it wouldn't have been easy. Right. This would have been some work. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Oof. 
He then laid Ockenden's corpse spread eagled above him on his bed, and then he watched television for several hours before wrapping the body in plastic bags and stowing the corpse beneath the floorboards. Next to... Yep. Well, no, he burned the first, oh, yeah, the right. first one after yeah. eight months, Scott. That's right, yeah. 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 So this is the new one now. Yeah, I got a new one now. Being new one. stored underneath yep. the yep. floorboards. Yep. Didn't want him to leave, so he, he ain't going nowhere now. On approximately... Hold on to yourself here, right, well, Mike. Here we go. On approximately four occasions over the following month, following month, Dennis disinterred Ockton's body from beneath the floorboards and seated the body in an armchair alongside him as they wa- basically they watched television together and drank alcohol. So he is literally this guy that's been dead for a month. He's pulling him under the floorboards. He's putting him in the chair. And Break, he's, breaking more shit to get him in that position. And he's sitting there with his glass, with his arm around him, like mm. they're hanging out, pretending that they're hanging out watching TV. Keeps talking to him. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about his hard day at work. Mm. Dennis killed his third victim, 16-year-old Martin Duffy, okay. on May 17th, 1980. Duffy was a catering student from Birkenhead, Maryside. Okay. Yeah. Who had hitchhiked to London without his parents' knowledge on May 13th after being questioned by British transport police for evading his train fare. Okay. So he basically got caught by the cops jumping the subway, yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah, whatever. turnstile, and he freaked out and ran away, basically. Yeah. yeah. For four days, Duffy had slept uh, near the railway station, basically like as a homeless kid. Yeah. Before Dennis encountered the youth. And yeah, offered him a meal and a bit some beer. As he returned from a union conference. Oh, okay. So he's coming back from work and he yeah. runs. Here's this kid in kind of in the gutter, you know, for lack of better. Yeah. Term. So he's going he's gonna to help him out. Uh, Dennis later recollected that Duffy was both exhausted and hungry and happily accepted his offer of a meal and a bed for the evening. So once again, yep. come on back. I'll cook a meal. meal yeah. Help you Hang out. out. Yeah. After Duffy had fallen asleep in Dennis's bed. Dennis fashioned a ligature around his neck, then simultaneously sat on Duffy's chest and tightened the ligature mm. with a great force. So he uh, he chokes him. He watch, He wants to watch it. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Dennis held this grip until Duffy became unconscious. He then dragged the youth into his kitchen and drowned him in the kitchen sink. He's into this, like, strangle, not to kill. Strangle just to get unconscious and then to well, drag them to well, water and he, drown them. He wants that set. Well, it's like some people like to, you know, they like that choke thing. And as long as you don't take it too far. Right. I, it's just crazy. Yeah. I, and I'm like wondering, does that have a tie to the whole fish, the grandfather fishing, dying on a boat? Is that why the water? I mean, I, he didn't drown. He had a heart attack. I don't know. Oh, it's crazy. Well, I mean, it's it's less messy than shooting him. You're right. Stabbing, stabbing him. Yeah, no blood. Yeah, no blood. blood. So... But just in, why not just strangle them until they're dead? Why do you strangle them until they're well, unconscious? Well, because that takes a lot of work. Yeah, but doesn't it take more work to then drag well, an unconscious does. person I, I get it. and lift them into the kitchen sink? Well, yeah, to, you would think so. You know what I mean? But, but I know they say it takes, what, like 14 minutes to actually strangle somebody? Yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah. I mean, it's, not a quick, it's not a quick death. He then bathes with the body. <laughs> so he takes a bath with the body. Hope he's got a big tub. Jesus. And Dennis later said that this guy was, quote, the youngest looking I had ever seen. That's wow. Simple. Duffy's body was first placed on a kitchen chair, then on the bed. Then the body was repeatedly kissed, complimented, and caressed by Dennis. Because he was the youngest looking. Both before and after he had masturbated while sitting upon the stomach of the corpse. Mm-hmm. For two days, Duffy's body was stowed in a cupboard before Dennis noted signs of bloating. And therefore, quote, he went straight under the floorboards, un- end quote. And was pulled out later for other things. Right. Hey, everybody, please pardon the interruption while I take a moment to talk about Trailblazer Threads. Now, this is a company that my girlfriend and I started. It's outdoor apparel for RVers, hikers, fishermen, anybody who loves the outdoors. So if you're in the market for a t-shirt or a hoodie to wear on your next adventure, 
give us a try. Trailblazerthreads.com. Get 10% off with promo code 2MM10. Again, that's trailblazerthreads.com. Following Duffy's murder, Dennis began to kill with increasing frequency. Okay. Okay. Yep. Gotta feel he's, that murder. Yeah, gotta feel that. Gotta feel, yeah. He, he likes it. Yep. He likes what he's doing. Yep. And he's getting away with it. He's getting away with it. So before the end of 1980, he killed five more victims, attempted to murder one more. So we're five, six, seven, eight murdered, two attempted. Two attempted. Only one of these victims that uh, Dennis murdered, 26-year-old William Sutherland, has ever been identified. Oh. So we've got... So he didn't burn him. So we got the first three. Now we've got five more, but only one of those five has ever been identified. So we got four that are still, to this day... Well, because you burned him. You burned him. Unidentified. Right. That or they just couldn't find... I mean, DNA wasn't a thing then. No. You know, you find burned bodies, but... No one's reported someone missing, or I don't know. You know, they just, they've never identified. It's kind yeah. of crazy to think yeah. about. Well, I mean, someone went down the, the plumbing, too. Uh, Dennis's recollections of the unidentified victims were vague, but he graphically recalled how each victim had been murdered and just how long the body had been retained before dissection. Oh, yeah. Of course he does. One unidentified victim Because they're trophies. Oh, yeah. He's keeping them along. I think he's keeping them around as long as he possibly can. Possibly can. It's, a, it's a trophy thing. Right. Yeah. Um, one unidentified victim killed in November had moved his legs in a cycling motion as he was strangled. This is like him recalling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dennis is known to have absented himself from work between 11th and 18th of November likely due to this particular murder. So he's calling off work now. Oh, because... To yeah. mess with these, mess with these yeah. bodies and stuff. Another unidentified victim, Dennis, had unsuccessfully attempted to resuscitate before sinking to his knees and sobbing, then spitting at his own image as he looked at himself in the mirror. So he took that one too far. I don't know what's happening with this guy. So he murders this one. He's telling the story. This one per, and we're on to this is now victim number let's say three, four, five, six. This is like the sixth one in all this. He kills him, but then tries to resuscitate him. Mm-hmm. Like he has second thoughts all of a sudden. Well, he wants to keep him around longer. But then he, when he realizes the guy's dead, he sinks to his knees, cries, and then goes and looks in the mirror and spits at himself in mm-hmm. the face like you he, disgusting pig. Because he took it too far. But he's taken it too far five other times. So there must have been something about this one that he didn't want to. Must have. Take it all away yet. On another occasion, he had um, laid in the bed alongside the body of an unidentified victim as he listened to the classical theme fanfare for the common man before bursting into tears. Fanfare for the common man. The classical theme fanfare for the common man. So he's laying next to these bodies in bed, listening to this very specific song and crying. Fanfare for what? What was it? Fanfare for the common man. Oh, that's by em- that's uh, that's Emerson Lake and Palmer. Oh, really? Yeah. Is that it? Interesting. Never heard of it. I don't think I've heard of that song. Hmm. hmm. Okay. So, um, see, I'm getting better at Google. <laughs> You're getting quicker. I'm getting quicker. So, inevitably, the accumulated bodies beneath Nielsen's floorboards, because that's where he's thrown all yeah, these people, yeah. attracted insects and created a foul order, foul oh. odor. Oh, no, no shit. Particularly throughout summer months. <laughs> well, yeah, when it gets hot. Yeah. Wow. On occasions when uh, Nielsen disinterred victims from beneath the floorboards, he noted that the bodies were covered with. Uh, pupae and infested with maggots. Pupae, pupae, pup, poop. I can't. I don't know why I can't say poop. larva. Larva. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. 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 Uh, some victims' heads had maggots crawling out of the eye sockets. Yeah, because that's usually what happens when you kill somebody. He placed deodorants beneath the floorboards and sprayed insecticides in the flat twice daily. But the odor of decay and the presence yeah, of just, flies remain. You, you can't beat that smell. You cannot get it rid of that. It takes a lot to get rid of that smell. So, in especially when they start to melt, get that oh, juice in them. Oh, 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 oh
So this leads Dennis in late 1980 to remove and dissect the bodies of each victim killed since December 1979. So a full year, some of these have been under the floorboards. His neighbors never complained? No. No. Interesting, right? Well, he was on the ground floor, so he's not putting them in the the ceiling. Right. He's putting them, so... If he was on the upper floor, I think they would start to... Or there'd be like a circle of juice growing on the yeah, ceiling below. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that might happen later on a different oh, God. address. Yeah, sheesh. So, um, so basically, he, he dissects each one and he burns them on the communal bonfire he had constructed behind the flat in the garden. Okay. Okay. Burning a fool. To disguise the smell of the burning flesh of the six dissected bodies, he puts on the fire... An old car tire. It's actually kind of smart. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, yeah, you got to be. I mean, I. Part of me, as a neighbor, I'd be pissed he's burning a tire because that stinks. Yeah, it does. But smart to cover up burning body smell. Yeah, because that's a whole other. That's a whole other smell. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Get this though. So he starts this fire. Three neighborhood children stood to watch this particular bonfire because they don't know what they're looking at. Yeah. Hey, can we get the marshmallows? And Dennis later wrote in his memoirs that he felt it would have seemed in order if he had seen these three children dancing around a mass funeral fire. Okay. Weird guy. Well, he's put more fantasy into it. Yeah. When the bonfire was reduced to ashes and cinders, Dennis used a rake to search the debris for any recognizable bones. Smart. Smart. Noting a skull was still intact. He smashed it to pieces with his rake. So at least he's smart. He's really trying to get rid of evidence here. Yeah, he is. Because uh, his neighbors probably use that fire pit. Yeah. So you can't you can't leave a can't leave anything like a femur yeah. <laughs> laying in a bonfire. Yeah, be kind of like an unburnt finger. Right. So around January fourth, nineteen eighty one, mm. Dennis encountered an unidentified man who he, he described to investigators as eighteen year old blue eyed young Scott. His type. His type. Runs into this kid at the Gold Line Pub in Soho. Okay. He was lured to Melrose Avenue upon the promise of partaking in a drinking contest. So, hey, let's go play some beer pong. <laughs> yeah. At my place. I don't okay. know. Was beer pong a thing back then? I don't think so. After Quarters. Den- Quarters? Yeah. Okay. After Dennis and this victim had consumed several beverages, Dennis strangled him with a tie again mm-hmm. and subsequently placed the body beneath the floorboards. Dennis is known to have informed his employers he was ill and in, unable to attend work on January 12th um, so that he could dissect both this victim and another unidentified victim he had killed approximately one month earlier. So he's just chugging along with these murders. Sure is. By April, Dennis had killed two more unidentified victims, one of whom he described as an English skinhead whom he had met at a uh, Lincester Square. The other he described as Belfast boy. Okay. A man in his early 20s, approximately 5'9", whom he had murdered sometime in February. He's the point. He can't even remember date. I, was, I think it was February. Oh, uh, well, yeah. So whatever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course. In relation to the first of these three unidentified victims, he later casually reflected, quote, end of the day, end of the drink, end of a person. Floorboards back, carpet replaced, and back to work at Denmark Street. So he is just... He is casual about this shit. Yeah. Hmm. Craziness. I mean, it's his life. Yeah. This is what he's... He's living out his fantasies. And his fantasies just keep getting... You got to keep fueling that fire, man. The following month, Dennis removed the internal organs of several victims stowed beneath his floorboards. He discarded these innards both upon the waste ground behind his flat. So like a... What do they call it? Like it sounds like a um, common area, like a little, little uh, um, yeah, compost pot, compost, compost pile, thing, yeah, yeah, um, and in his household trash, so like the trash that goes out for the trash. When you guy. think about it; those organs are all dried up now, right? And probably aren't even stinking at this point anymore. Well, well, maybe a little bit, a little bit. I would think. But they're not going to be recogni- as recognizable. Right. Like, no one's going to know what that is. It just yeah. think it's bad meat or something somebody's thrown out. Ugh. The final victim to be murdered at Melrose Avenue was 23-year-old Malcolm Barlow, 
who Dennis discovered slumped against a wall outside his home oh. on September 17th of 81. Well, he woke up in. What a bad f***ing place yeah. to pass out. Yeah. <laughs> like, that poor guy. Poor, I mean, Jesus, man. You, well, of, all you, of all places to pass out. There's the wall. You yeah. can see the wall. Yeah. This guy picked the wrong wall to lean against while, while being drunk. Yeah. Mm. Uh, when Dennis inquired as to uh, Barlow's welfare, so he sees this kid. Hey, man, you yeah. all right? You all right? You doing okay? He was informed the medication Barlow was prescribed for his ep- epilepsy had caused his legs to weaken. So he's basically telling this guy, I'm weak. I have epilepsy. I don't have my meds. I can't walk. Oh, ding. Hey, uh, why don't you come on in? I'll uh, fix us something to eat. We have a beer, too. So Dennis suggested that Barlow should be in a hospital and uh, supporting him, walked him into his residence residence before phoning for an ambulance. Oh, so he he's like, actually helping him. What? He actually helped the guy. <laughs> Just wait, Mike. Oh, God. He did. So he calls an ambulance for this kid. The ambulance takes him to the hospital. Okay. The following day, Barlow is released from the hospital and returned to Dennis's home, apparently to thank him for saving his life. He was invited inside and after eating a meal, began drinking rum and Coke before falling asleep on the sofa. Wherein he got strangled to death. Dennis manually strangled Barlow as he slept before stowing his body beneath his kitchen sink the following morning. So he doesn't want to prey on somebody that's injured. Mm. So let's get him to the hospital and get him fixed up. And then he shows back up at the door. Oh, he's, he's healthy now. Yeah. Mm. That's <laughs> f***ed up. Oh, <laughs> Jesus, man. In mid 1981, Dennis's landlord decided to renovate 195 Melrose Avenue. Oh, wonder why? Uh oh. Probably because it smells a little bit in there. And he asked Dennis to vacate the property. Can you imagine? He's probably like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, crap. I got six bodies under there. What are we going to do? Dennis was initially resistant to their proposal. I, I wonder why. <laughs> yeah. But accepted an offer of $1,000 from the landlord to vacate. So okay. the landlord really wanted to renovate this place, probably because it was stinking. Yeah. Yeah. And gives him $1,000 to leave. Yeah. He probably wishes he would have got that back once he opened up the floorboards. Dennis moved into an attic flat at 23D Cranley Gardens. Oh, Jesus. In the Muswell Hill District of North London on October 5th, 1981. Okay. The day before he vacated the property, Dennis burned the dissected bodies of the last five victims he had killed at this address upon a third and final bonfire he constructed in the garden behind the flat. Again, Dennis ensured the bonfire was crowned with an old car tire to disguise the smell of burning flesh. Dennis had already dissected the bodies of four of these victims in January and August and needed only to complete the dissection of Barlow for this third bonfire. This dude, I've lost count. Yeah, I don't know. Have you kept count at all? No, I've lost it after this. We got probably up to... 16 or 17, maybe. Right. Like, Somewhere in there. God, he is just, it's, it's like an unstoppable train yeah. at this point. Yeah, he's just... Uh, hmm. So you know what time it means it is? Oh. You know what time it is. Will Death, we got somebody to play? No, we don't have anybody to play. Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> All right, well, there we go. I'm sorry, we don't have anybody to play, but this is a good time to tell people how to play. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Wheel of Death. If you haven't seen an episode before, we have this really fantabulous wheel uh, that we bring up here on the table. It's got a bunch of free stuff, T-shirts, members to our Buy Me a Coffee memberships where you get bonus episodes, all that good stuff. Yep. Uh, we and, spin for you. Yeah, we'll spin for you. Yep. Um, I'm awesome. No, Mike sucks at this. Shut up. I, we, hey, it's, it did better last time. It's swinging the other way. Yeah. Um, so all you got to do is go to our website, 2 mm-hmm. Um, You'll see clearly the same wheel that's here um, is on our website. You just click on that. There's a little simple little sign-up form, name, email, phone number. Yep. We won't sell that to anybody. Nobody. Um, and then when we do get people who sign up for that, we have our little bucket of doom. We put the names in. We'll draw a name, get a hold of you on FaceTime here, and you can be on the show. Yep. And we'll spin the wheel. Might get something free. Or, or you might get death. You might have Ted Bundy come on the screen and yeah, get rid of you. Or, so, or you get lucky, you get the Wheel of Death shirt. Ooh, only available by playing the Wheel of Death. Yep. And we've only given away one of those so far. Yes. All right. So 
Dennis moves into this new address, this new attic flat, right? And the murders continue. I was surprised the landlord didn't catch anything at the other place. Right. But in true Ryan Seacrest fashion, you'll have to wait until next week for part two. Jesus Christ. (laughs) Part two will be our episode next week. So if you want to hear the conclusion, now he's at a new address and he is brazen as ever. And these things get crazier, especially the way that he is caught. So make sure that you subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to. Yeah, always subscribe and like. So you get notified next week when we drop part two. You definitely want to tune into it because the ending is kind of crazy. Yep. Um, If you'd like, uh, if you like this episode and you want to support the show, head over to buymeacoffee.com slash two murder morons. It's kind of like Patreon. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but there you can simply buy Mike and I a coffee or you yeah. can sign up to be a member for as little as three bucks a three month. Three bucks. Three bucks a month. And uh, we do two bonus episodes a month every other week. You yep. get those. Um, and there's other benefits depending on the level. You could be one of our executive producers, all kinds of cool stuff on there. So yep. check out buymeacoffee.com slash two murder morons. Or, or, or merch. You can head to our merch store. We got. I'm wearing some today. I right. am not. It's okay. It's no, I got the hat. Yeah, you got, got the hat. hat. He's got, got the hat on. Got the trucker hat. But it's on backwards. Sorry. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, t-shirts, hats, AirPod cases. Yeah. Puzzles, puzzles underwear, underwear, with my face we'll on ju- it. Oh, I was gonna say we'll no, just have no, to no, they throw it out the there. <laughs> yeah, throw it out there. <laughs> but um, yeah, scan the uh, QR code here on your screen if you want to check that out again. That's just two murder morons. dot com. And yep. And it's not expensive. It's it's, it's reasonably priced and it's good stuff. And hey. Buy something. Right. And it's uh it supports the show. It helps yeah. us helps us out, keep, helps us keep going. Yeah, keeps us motivated. This isn't our full time job or anything, and we no. you know yeah we, uh, we gotta pay to <laughs> run this thing. We gotta pay the light bills, man. We gotta pay the light bills and the equipment and this and that. I mean, no. Yeah, you know, it costs money. Also wanted to remind everybody if you are listening right now, consider watching on YouTube or Spotify. And if you're watching and prefer to listen, our podcast can be found on any of the platforms that we're showing on your screen right now. Also, we have to give credit where credit is due. Yep. Um, we read from and used the Wikipedia page on Dennis Nilsson to research this episode. And uh, on Google. And on, yes, and, yep, the Google. and Google. Yep. Uh, so if you'd like to look up this crazy story yourself and see even more of the details, the link for that is in the description. So, okay, Mike. So the thrilling, the crazy, the kooky, insane ending of this story. We'll air next week. I have to come back next week to hear it. Let's come back next week. You don't want to miss it. Okay. I'll you be don't here. want to miss it. I'll be here. He'll be here, but you don't want to miss it. Yeah. You better be here. Yeah. So we'll see you all next yep. Wednesday. See you guys. <laughs>